Hello. Our story begins inside the throne room on Mandalore. Bo-Katan watched, horrified by the actions taken by Darth Maul. He used the Mandalorians to get what he wanted, and his only opponent, Pre Vizsla, was no match for him. Maul took the Darksaber and killed the former ruler of Death Watch. This was against the Mandalorian way. There was no feasible way for an outsider to take the throne or the Darksaber. Who knows what Maul would do from here, what kind of carnage he would create on their home planet. As Maul hoisted the Darksaber above his head, Bo watched as a group of Mandalorians bowed before him, accepting him as their rightful ruler. Bo couldn't allow this, so before Maul could rejoice in his victory, she called out to him. I challenge you for the Dark Saber, you monster. You dare challenge me, Lady Kreez? I will make you suffer. And then when I'm done with you, I will murder your sister. Bo raged, throwing her helmet over her head and started to run forward. She was already in significant disadvantage. Maul was a force user and he also held the dark saber and a lightsaber. The only thing that Bo had to protect herself with was a copious amount of Beskar over her body. It was the only defense she could use against Maul, and without hesitation she popped forward with her jetpack, kneeing Maul across the face as the swing blatantly missed her. Savage stood around the corner, pacing around the outside of the circle, watching his brother fight the Mandalorian. The other Mandalorians got to their feet and backed off ever so slightly, giving the two fighters room for their fight to transpire. Maul ignited both of his weapons and both turned around to see what she was facing. She used her quick thinking to shot a grapple around Maul's legs, and leapt forward with her jetpack, pulling Maul's legs out from under him twisting him to the side. As he fell, the Darksaber flipped from his hands and spun across the floor. Bo opened up the shield on her wrist and slid towards the ancient weapon. Maul saw this as an opportunity and he struck down at her, slamming onto her shield. He raged and swung harder and harder, but his second strike slammed right into the floor of the palace throne room. He turned to his side took an elbow across the face from bo -Katan. Though Maul was tough, his immediate response was to swing back at her, and their two blades collided. Bo had practice with his weapon similar to the Dark Saber, so she was already familiar with how to operate it. The weight of the weapon fell naturally into her physical tolerance for the energy that surrounded it. When Maul swung back around, he was thrown off by a burst from Bo's knee, which shot explosive rounds into his chest. As Maul tumbled backwards, Bo swung forward, cutting through one of Maul's front horns, jolting him into a set of Mandalorians, who caught him and threw him back into the fight. Bo raised her arm and clobbered Maul across the chest. Though, as a Sith, he would not yield until his last breath. Instead of accepting the feat as Vizsla had, Maul would try and get back up. But Bo kicked him across the back, throwing him from his feet. Savage called out Maul's name as he ignited his own lightsaber. Bo jabbed the darksaber through Maul's back, throwing him to the floor without a final breath. As Bo turned around, she looked into the eyes of the hulking Savage Oprez, as he scattered a bunch of Mandalorians to get to her. Though Bo was the new leader of Mandalore, and Savage hadn't challenged her to a fight, she used her jetpack to leap above Savage, telling her people, Capture that beast, tie him down. We will execute him in front of all of Mandalore. The Mandalorians immediately got to work, blasting grapples around the massive body and dragging him to the ground. Bo watched in amusement as she looked at her sister's throne. Bo thought about her sister, who was currently situated in the prison on Sindari. She turned around and watched Savage slam down into the ground as another Mandalorian kicked him across the jaw, knocking him out instantly. Bo stopped and took a seat on the stairs leading up to the throne itself. One of the Mandalorians asked what she was doing, as Bo told them to go away telling the Mandalorian to give her some time to prepare her speech in front of Mandalore. The Mandalorian nodded their head and got up as they left the room along with Savage. Bo didn't really actually have to think about her speech. That was easy. What wasn't easy was facing her sister. She could only imagine what would have happened to Satine had Maul kept the Darksaber. At the end of all this, Bo in a way understood her sister. Something in seeing Pre Vizsla's death shook Bo Katan enough for her to realize that maybe her pride had been misplaced. Maybe her motives were wrong and it utilized her pride of Mandalore for the wrong actions. As Bo reflected about her time with the Death Watch, she realized that there was nothing wrong with being prideful of her warrior past. It was what she did with it that was wrong. Burning down a village of innocent civilians, enslaving their women, and executing them wasn't on par with Mandalore. It was on par with the savagery depicted by these Dathomirian thugs. Mandalore was more than just being a warrior. It was so much more prideful than just acts of oppression on those who couldn't fight back. After a few hours alone, Gar Saxon would walk in and tell her that the people were ready for her. 
Bo looked up and nodded her head, rising to her feet and grabbing the ancient weapon of Vandalore. When she got to the deck overlooking Sundari, she felt for a brief moment what it was like to be her sister. She felt the overwhelming stress of leading four million people that called this planet home, and what that meant she had to embody for all of them. Bo stood tall, standing between her closest allies as she spoke up. This pirate, along with the traitor Pre Visla, betrayed the trust of Mandalore. They overthrew our government for the sole purpose of running a pirating operation out of our prideful world. We as Mandalorians do not bow or bend to anyone, and I shall set this pirate and every pirate straight. As Mandalore will take the fight to this scum and defeat them, we will stand tall and we will be united together. Bro raised the dark saber over her head and ignited the weapon and dropped it down at Savage's neck. The crowd had a genuine mixed reaction to it. Sure, they were all Mandalorians, many of them having served during the Mandalorian Civil War that happened nearly 20 years before him. But those that changed were looking for change. Well, of course, the other half of the crowd was much more patriotic to this action. Bo raised the Darksaber over her head for one final applause before abandoning the observation deck and walking back inside. Once inside, she told her allies that she would be going to visit her sister. When Bo arrived in the prison, she opened up her sister's cell and walked in, setting her helmet down to the side and sitting down. Neither of them said a word. They sat in silence for a short period of time, just staring at each other. It was awkward. It had been several years since they last saw each other or talked to each other. The two of them didn't say a word until Satine noticed the Darksaber and asked. Did you win that? I did. I realized a lot after winning it. What did you learn? Our Mandalorian pride doesn't belong to anyone but us. It doesn't belong in the hands of criminals, Sith, or Jedi. Well, now that you've got the Darksaber, how do you intend to lead? I intend on bringing Mandalore together, the past and the present the warriors and the peaceful ones. How are you going to do that, sister? With your help, maybe we could, you know, work together. You know I'd love to work with you, Bo. I've never held resentment against you for your choices. You're my sister, we can disagree, but I'll never not love you for who you are. I'm sorry, Satine, I really am. There's no need for that, sister. The two sisters got up and gave each other a massive hug, the two of them embracing the other, in a way symbolizing the embrace that needed to happen between those who walked with the way and those who didn't. The two sisters smiled at each other and left the prison building. Bo asked her sister questions about leadership and Satine answered all of them, being as insightful and as helpful as she could be, though Bo voiced one concern about their role as leaders. Neither one of them had ever seen the mythosaur, and for those who walked the way, that would be one of their biggest complaints. But then Satine spoke up. Sister, I did see the Mythosaur. Of course I believe in the way of the Mandalore. But politically, Mandalore cannot be that. Mandalore being so warrior-focused drives people away from us. Look at my earrings, Bo. They are the tusks of the Mythosaur. And I haven't told many. But when I was a child, before father's death, he took me to the living waters. It was then when I saw it. Wait, why didn't you tell anyone? We were in civil war. Shortly after that, father died, and he left behind the role of leader that I had to fulfill. Mandalore couldn't afford its duchess to claim to have seen a mythological animal not seen for generations. Mandalore needed a leader, and that's what I forced myself to become. Bo looked at her sister, and her eyes batted down to the ground. Her sister was the one meant to walk both paths, according to those who followed the way. Satin was meant to be the one who walked both ways, the one truly meant to unify one Mandalore. And all this war did was tear it apart. Following Maul almost led to a complete destruction of everything Mandalore had worked to become in such a short period of time. Bo reached down in her belt and grabbed the Darksaber, lifting it up and handing it towards her sister, suggesting that Satine be the one who wielded it. At this moment, the two of them were standing in the throne room, alone. Satine looked at her sister, and then down at the Darksaber itself. Satine put her hand around the Darksaber itself and smiled at her sister, slowly raising the blade between the two of them. She said the word, together and Bo smiled, saying the word in unison with her sister. If they were going to unite the people, then the sisters from Kalvala would have to do it together. Satine didn't believe in a warrior way anymore, but she would walk the way with her sister, because if it meant the betterment of Mandalore, then she would do what it took. Though, Bo did inform her sister that Mandalore was at war, which wasn't the easiest pill to swallow for Satine initially. But when she found out who it was with, she decided that it was worth it. And upon such ceremony, Satine would break out her own armor. Being the firstborn of her family, she was always destined to be the Duchess of Mandalore. And while the luxuries of being the Duchess were fine and all, nothing compared to the glistening armor she had locked away for so long. While Satine never wore her armor, she did have it, 
and it was, in her mind, a piece that belonged to her family's legacy, especially after her parents' death that was so important to her. Satine put her armor on and joined her sister before the entirety of Mandalore, the two of them hoisting the dark saber above their heads, but in between them, as to depict unity, Satine would tell the people of Mandalore, We will not be afraid of the thugs that sit on our doorstep. We will not let them scare us. We are Mandalorians. We are the strongest people the galaxy has ever seen, not just because of our warrior past, but because of the powerful future that stands before us. We will unite and we will be feared, showing these pirates that Mandalore will not be taken lightly ever again. When the event was over, Satine and their sister walked back to the throne room. Satine told her sister that if they were to work together, they needed to utilize the best part about each of them individually. Bo was a strong warrior, she didn't take anything from anyone, so naturally, she would fit right into where she belonged. Satine, on the other hand, hadn't touched a weapon since she was just a child. Her role would be maintaining the political balance with the other neutral systems that she had within her coalition, though Bo asked if her sister was truly okay with the Mandalorians being warriors. Satine admitted her own shortfalls in that department. It was a slight overreaction on her part. Moving past barbarism made sense, but getting rid of the Mandalorian traditions wouldn't sit right with the still barbaric individuals. And while not all of them were barbarians, duh, some of them lacked the proper etiquette at certain times. Satine admitted that their peace brought Mandalore prosperity, but to others, it appeared as weakness. She would also support Bo as long as Bo supported her. The sisters were in the same corner, they had each other's back, but there was something Bo would leave to her sister, which surprised even Satine. Bo wanted Satine to remain the Duchess of Mandalore. The difference in their speeches in front of the people was the defining factor. Satine wasn't a warrior, but when she put her gear on and strutted her stuff, she was a Mandalorian goddess. Speaking with the eloquence of the Force itself and inspiring every living being who heard the words, it's not something that just anyone could learn. Some people were just born with it, and the sister who walked both ways was. That was fine for Bo, because she had the Darksaber, and she would still be a leader, though it would be a leader of the military operations. And so, the Crimson Mandalore War began. Mandalore was sitting at full strength, and as long as they kept using their full strength, they wouldn't be stopped by anybody. bo led the military campaign, though shortly after bo left, Obi-Wan got to Mandalore to find Duchess Satine wearing her Mandalorian armor. Stunning to say the least, for how Kenobi felt about it. He was extremely excited to learn that she and her sister made up. The dyad between Satine and Bo would work to the likes of both parties of the Mandalore, and Obi-Wan couldn't help but be excited for his beloved Satine. He would take the weapon of the former Sith, Maul, and Savage back to Coruscant for the Jedi to lock away. The confirmed deaths of two Sith would take pressure off of Obi-Wan at the very least, and he would inform Satine that he'd be there for her anytime she needed him, to which she said the same would be the case for him. While bo was leading a massive war against the pieces of the Crimson Dawn that had been lightly established, Satine was returning to the politics of the galaxy. She could see the political change happening within the Galactic Republic, and in fear that the Republic was heading down towards a road of tyranny, she began to do everything in her power, which was quite a lot, to seal off close ties with the Republic and strengthen the power of the Neutral System Coalition that worked under Mandalore. On the planet Nakadia, a massive fleet of Mandalorian Starcraft exited hyperspace, and a war began against the Black Suns. The pirates were initially unprepared, and this surprise attack ruptured their peace. The base here in Acadia was rather small, so it wouldn't take much to overpower it, but considering the attackers were Mandalorian, the time it took to defeat the Black Sun pirates didn't take that long at all. They rushed down from the skies with their jetpacks dropping out of their troop transports and they obliterated their challengers. The Black Sun was no match, but the only issue is this exposed the pirates to the fact that Mandalore was no longer with them. The entire purpose of Crimson Dawn was to unite the crime world and turn them into a major empire, which in its early stages was a bit off to a success, but with Mandalore turning against these pirates, it was obvious to Crimson Dawn and the various other crime families that their new rival was Mandalore. Though bo was prepared for all of this, as she beelined it back to Mandalore from Nakadia after wiping out the entire outpost and burning everything the Black Sun had to the ground. 
When Bo returned to Mandalore, they caught a group of pirates off guard. The Pike Syndicate sent a small mercenary fleet to Mandalore to deal with the Mandalorians, being that on the galactic stage they were still represented by Duchess Satine, making them appear as if they were not a threat to anybody. It was a genius play. Politically, Mandalore was still neutral and unarmed as could be. But militaristically, they were trained better than most of the Grand Army of the Republic. When the mercenaries realized that they were trapped, it was far too late for them to escape, and subsequently, they were all destroyed. Mandalore would sit proudly at the center of the Neutral System Coalition until the end of the Clone Wars, which would come a mere year and a half after the Maul insurgency. While the end of the Clone Wars was certainly positive, there was an overarching issue. The change from the Republic to an Empire, the ongoing Crimson Mandalore War, and the disappearance of the Jedi and the ever-so-odd death of Senator Padme Amidala. Something felt odd about this quick and radical change in the galaxy, though one thing Satine couldn't get her mind off of was if her dearly beloved had survived. The political atmosphere had changed and Satine had to navigate this new atmosphere with the Empire. Mandalore currently had a strong place in the galaxy from a political perspective. Not quite the same level as Alderaan because Alderaan was a part of the Empire, but rather similar. That meant that the Empire had its eyes on Mandalore, but there wasn't exactly a reason for the Empire to take Mandalore as an actual threat. From the little known reports from around the Outer Rim, Mandalore was just cleaning up the threat of crime lords that threatened their own rule. With the recent fall of Doran to the Mandalorians, it seemed as if the crime families were losing their grip, Doran being a former world that was utilized by the Huts for several years. This twist of events found many planets and senators within the Empire finding favorability with Mandalore, almost creating this untouchable aura around the planet itself. On the other hand, Obi-Wan Kenobi, having survived the Purge and killing his best friend, at least to his knowledge, was debating the location of the Skywalker twins. Leia was obviously going to Alderaan, but what about Luke? Initially, Obi-Wan was going to head to Tatooine because it was a safe option, but was it really that safe? Tatooine is where Vader grew up. Surely the Emperor would look for the twins there. Of course, Palpatine knew that Kenobi was one of the several survivors of the Purge, but he didn't really care. Obi-Wan didn't fit into the bigger picture, and surely Kenobi would out himself out accidentally, which is something the Jedi couldn't resist doing. Especially with the Grand Inquisitor serving the Emperor, there were plenty of opportunities for Jedi hunters to find Kenobi and kill him. Obi-Wan had two thoughts, the first one being taking Luke to Tatooine, and the second one being taking Luke to the planet of Mandalore and allowing him to grow up similarly to how Leia would also grow. The only issue is Obi-Wan likely couldn't be seen on Mandalore. His largest fear was what would happen to Satine and her people. He didn't want her people to suffer because of him. When Obi-Wan called her, she was very obviously relieved to hear that he was alright and that he had survived the purge. Kenobi had other motives for the conversation, informing her about the Skywalker twins and his hopes for Luke. Satine being quick on her feet would help out Obi-Wan immediately, though there needed to be major change involving everything with him. Satine could, as Duchess, change the records of her people, meaning that she could make it seem as if Luke was born here on Mandalore, and she could also make it appear as if Obi-Wan had been born on Kalvala and the two of them had been secretly dating for forever, which they basically were. Of course, the several times Kenobi was here, he was on Jedi business, so they would have to change his personal appearance a little bit, which would result in him shaving off his beard. He would go by another name as well, that being Ben, to hide his identity. Satine called Obi-Wan Ben anyways, so it worked out rather well. From there, they could make it seem as if Kenobi was Mandalorian the entire time. Obi-Wan's fear of how this would work overshadowed the brilliance of this plan. Luke would be brought to Mandalore and the documents would show that he was Satine's child, making Luke a Kreez. Also, being that individuals that married into Mandalorian royal families often changed their names, it made Ben Kenobi, Ben Kreez, and Luke Skywalker, Luke Kreez. It would work in their favor and it was something that both parties were extremely happy about because it kept them safe from the Empire. Though Obi-Wan also needed something. He needed his own set of Mandalorian armor, so they had his armor made in the Great Forge, and then they made a new set for him. The first set being made to look like older armor one that could have belonged to a father or grandfather, the next set of armor to represent his royal status, which was essentially being married to the Duchess, since marrying a Duchess didn't have any benefits in the realm of titles, like giving him the title of Duke. While Satine and Ben were fabricating this new life on Mandalore, bo was going for the throat of the Hutt families, well, technically. For the last year and a half, all had been going alright. 
though there was a Mandalorian challenger for Bo to take down. Gar Saxon believed that the Dark Saber belonged to his family, and so, on board of the vessel on the way to Tatooine, he challenged Bo Katan for the Dark Saber. She accepted the challenge despite preparing for a battle with Jabba the Hutt, one of the many crime lords who hired the best bounty hunters in the entire galaxy casually. Regardless, Bo Katan had a bit of a disadvantage here in height. Gar Saxon was a much larger man than Maul, and he was a physically dominating individual. Sure, he didn't have the force, but he made up for it. Bo knew that she would have to close the distance between the two of them while they were fighting, so that she could stop him from defeating her. If she didn't close that gap, then her fight would be extremely difficult to win, even with the Darksaber in her hands. Though Bo's first move wasn't the Darksaber. While it was a useful weapon, a blade like the Darksaber would be more useful for a force user, this early in a fight at least. Bo moved in forward and she slid with her feet out under her as she collided with Saxon's shins and he fell over. Bo used this opportunity to get on top of him and disarm him, but he used his sheer strength to throw her across the bridge on the ship. Bo opened up her wrist shield as Gar Saxon began to fire her. She blocked every shot as she closed in on Saxon. He used his grapple to pull her legs out from under her and towards him. As she slid, he unloaded his fist, though she moved out of the way fast enough at the last second just fast enough to avoid being hit in the face by him. His fist slammed into the deck of the ship, denting it ever so slightly. Bo wrapped her legs around his arm and pulled him over her head, pinning him to the ground, demanding that he yield. But Gar was too stubborn to yield, throwing her off of him again. This one move informed her that this was a fight to the death. Had he just been trying to assert dominance, a yield would have sufficed. But he was clearly going for the Dark Saber, to be the leader of Mandalore. Gar pulled out his Vibro Blade, to which Bo responded with the Dark Saber. This could get tricky. The Vibro Blade would be a great counter-attack to the Dark Saber, specifically because it was so much smaller and agile. Bo had to be quick on her feet, and as delicate as she could be with all of her movements. If she wasn't, then Gar could very easily win. He jabbed forward, moving his feet closer to hers. She had the range disadvantage, even with the Darksaber, so every time he threw his blade forward, he nearly got her. Bo moved back, delicately, and then when Gar Saxon overstepped, she had her moment to strike, swinging the blade down on the soft spot between Gar's armor, hitting him between the knee pad and the thigh pad, pulling up just enough not to cut through the leg all the way, before pulling his left arm to the ground and striking his ribs, cutting them down as well. As she stood over him, without a moment of hesitation, she cut down on his neck, killing him, too. Bo turned around and told the other Mandalorians that they were in this fight together. They should honor each other by taking the fight to their real enemies, the Huts. The ships exited hyperspace and descended into the atmosphere of Tatooine. Taking out Jabba was by far the biggest task for these Mandalorians to complete. They dropped down from their gunships, and the assault began. A number of bounty hunters and smugglers were stationed outside of the palace, Though, when the first group of them dropped, the higher paid bounty hunters knew it wasn't worth their lives, so they booked it. Retreating and allowing the Bokatan led Mandalorians to breach the palace. The pirates were slaughtered, and as the Mandalorians stepped through the palace, they got the Jabba, where Bokatan executed him. The Mandalorians cleared out the rest of the palace and burned it to the ground. While initially this seemed positive, this would have terrible ramifications on the Outer Rim. Jabba ran the most prestigious criminal empire in the galaxy. He evaded the strength of the empire, and even negotiated with the Republic on his terms. He was able to maintain the entire economy of Tatooine and several other planets in the Outer Rim. With him gone, the Empire jumped down into the Outer Rim, meaning that individuals like Owen and Beru would begin to deal with the Empire on a consistent basis, which only made Kenobi's move to Mandalore fit so perfectly. Satine, while not a part of the Empire, would keep tabs on everything going on in the Empire for years. She would learn about the treatment of clone troopers from Senator Chuchi, and the combined effort with Ben, Bo, and herself, they would bring retired clone troopers to Mandalore, turning them all into people. Obi-Wan found it within himself to forgive all the clones. He was one of the best Jedi in the Order during its heights, and he wouldn't allow that pain that they caused to change who he was as a man or as a Jedi. It's what Satine loved about him anyways. Bringing these clones to Mandalore would give them several options. The first one for them to continue being soldiers, considering they were all essentially Mandalorians at this point. The second option was to integrate them into society reasonably, which meant that they got their own district to be in, and they also got jobs, payments, and lives to live. 
For soldiers, unlike Rex, Echo, and the Bad Batch, it was a place to go, on the down low. Not that the Empire would really care about a bunch of former clones going anywhere in the galaxy, especially because the Empire wasn't paying for them. Though it did really go under the radar for the Empire because no one really cared about the clones aside from the ones that were still serving the Empire. But aside from the deserters, the executed, or the troopers themselves, there was not much care for the Jango Fett clones, which made Mandalore the place for them to be. They were given a chance at a fresh start, and it was more than anyone else in the entire galaxy would do. It really wasn't much of a debate for Satine. She didn't see the clones as troopers, she saw them as humans being treated like droids, and she couldn't stand for it. The reality is, most of the clones who came to Mandalore took up normal lifestyles. The few of them who didn't were typically special unit soldiers like commanders or arc troopers. On the other hand, young Skywalker was being raised in a loving household, one that he should have been able to experience with his real parents. The only struggle for Satine and Ben was how to tell Luke about his lineage, because they didn't want people to think that he was being adopted or not in fact Mandalorian. Luke handled not being a Kree as well, being that he was told about it at a young age, though he never talked to anybody else aside from who he simply considered his parents about it. Luke spent a lot of his time with his aunt too. Whenever Bo wasn't out in the galaxy bringing justice to the several savages across the galaxy, she spent a lot of time teaching Luke about how to be a warrior. Luke learned a lot. He was probably the most versatile version of himself, raised by a Jedi, a politician, and a warrior. Alongside of his natural talents, he had so much raw potential and knowledge. Regardless of that, as the years continued by, the Empire got closer and closer to picking a fight with Mandalore. By this time, the Crimson Mandalore War had come to an end with Bo-Katan leading a final assault on Obadia, wiping out the surviving members of the Huts and the Black Sons, and of course the Pikes, who called Obadia their home, went to extinction rather swiftly. With the war over, the challenge began. Having spent so long at war with the Kryon families, the Mandalorians returned to the planet that was even more peaceful than it was when they left. Though Satine, Ben, and Bo planned for it, they created a Mandalorian Olympics for the warriors to participate in, to utilize the best of their talents, skills, without turning it against each other. At this point, the galaxy was really reaping on the pain that the Empire sowed into it, though Satine had been coordinating with Bail Organa and his daughter Leia, who was actively participating in the rebellion, such as gifting three hammerhead corvettes to the rebels on Lothal. Luke was getting involved as well, but he was keeping a safe distance away from his sister. They would have time to get together and know each other, but not yet. Luke's role was a little more minor because he was so powerful in the Force. His essence disrupted the Force itself, so Ben told Luke that to keep him safe, they wanted him on the sidelines for the time being. Luke being a teenager could have taken this as initiative to become rebellious. But he was a royal. There was no reason for him to become rebellious towards his parents. He trusted their process. With the rebellion kicking off at Lothal, Aldani, and Ferex, there was more opportunity for Mandalore to contribute. But they couldn't contribute wearing their armor. So bo would find some volunteers to shed their Mandalorian gear to contribute. It was a tough decision for the sisters, because they both wanted to contribute to the rebellion. And while Satine knew the logistical issues with not having Mandalorian armor for the warriors, she also knew that it was very identifiable. Wearing it would tell the Empire exactly where they should target next. Satine didn't want the war brought to them, so Bo, along with 30 other Mandalorians, would temporarily join the rebellion without their armor, assisting in their capture of Lothal. After the success of Lothal, Luke would be permitted to join the rebellion, getting sent to the secret base at Yavin during the Battle of Scarif. Instead of the blockade runner escaping Scarif to Tatooine, which was established Empire space at this point, the blockade runner would simply arrive outside of Ord Mantell, which had been captured by the Mandalorians during the Crimson Mando War. Though there was no sign of the Mandalorians here, aside from an operative picked by Ben Kreese himself. The name of this operative was Kyle Katarn, who got the droids and jumped planet to Yavin. The fight against the Empire galaxy-wide would kick off after Luke Kreese helped the Alliance defeat the first Death Star. Ben would then take Luke to Dagobah, where Luke would finish his training with Grandmaster Yoda. Obi-Wan, being too old to help Luke, would pass on his greatest student to face down Luke's father. Though, with the support from around the galaxy joining the Alliance, Satine would push for Mandalorians to fully back the Rebellion, and to the aid of the Rebels came the Mandalorians. The Galactic Civil War would see a lot more Rebel victories with the arrival of the Mandalorians, which would lead the Rebellion finding and destroying the second Death Star before it was ever operable. 
This led Skywalker to fighting his father aboard a Super Star Destroyer, and though he knew that Vader was his father, Luke was a Mandalorian, and his plan was to stop Vader and the Emperor. During this fight in front of Palpatine, Luke would defeat Vader, but he wouldn't kill him, because the Rebels had planned an ambush that ended up sending the Super Star Destroyer into a planet, Luke being able to escape due to the diligence of his plan. And while it seemed like the Sith had fallen, a new power in due time would rise, but Mandalore on the other hand would never fall. The Kree's legacy would live through Luke as he adopted the name of his adopted parents, Bo-Katan, and the name of his slightly younger adopted sister in Astrid Kenobi Kree's. The legacy of the Jedi would continue through Luke and Astrid, as they not only carried Obi-Wan Satine and Bo-Katan's name, but the Jedi Order itself as the galaxy evolved in an era with a strong Mandalore. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Boy, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Mad Manu Studios, Anakin 003, Jedi Sloth, Lemon Knight, Flynn Van Cease, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button. I heard a rumor that Earth Season 2 is coming soon. I have three more episodes left until I'm done. Let's talk about this story. Um, this story is was planned um, for a long time. Um, my, my good friends over at Fantasy Folklore, I know they did this two weeks ago, so... Um, this by no means was me copying them. <laughs> uh, nothing but respect for those guys. But uh, this story was this story was more of a, a prideful telling of Mandalore. I've done like polar opposites, and like I wanted this one to fit right in the middle, and that was all intended from the beginning. So um, I know comments were like, "Oh, this is too too barbaric, Mandalore. This is too you know new Mandalore." That those were all intended. I was building up this. Similarly to the finale of Mandalorian, this was building up to the finale of, of doing these Mandalorian videos. Of course, I'm going to keep doing them, but I was doing them in succession with, Mand with the Mandalorian, if you couldn't tell. Like, with, yeah, anyways. Um, so, this was really fun for me. I, I'm not going to lie, the first time, I, like, when I started working on the draft for this, I completely forgot that Satine hadn't died, so I had to, like, restart before I started writing, because I was like, oh, this is going to work really well. And then I was like, oh wait, Satine didn't die yet. So I had to rewrite around it, and I'm actually really happy with how it turned out. Um, overall, I would have gone the same direction, I feel like, uh, regardless of Satine being alive or not. The only difference is, is the interaction with the Empire. And the reason that interaction is so different is because uh, Satine is an established politician. She's been a politician for 20 years of her life. She took a Civil War planet, a planet in the middle of a Civil War, to literally prosperity to leading, I think it was uh, thousands of star systems that were in the neutral system coalition. So that kind of effect that she can have as a leader is something that I wanted to portray here, but I also wanted to portray that sisterly bond. Um, now one thing that I, I put in here, which I don't believe is confirmed canon, but it is now my personal head canon. I saw someone post it on Twitter, so shout out to that person, but the uh, the Satine, the, the, the earrings that Satine has, being look like they look like the Mythosaur. I never thought about that. I was like, that's actually so sick if that's what she's wearing them for. So I wanted to incorporate some of that into the story that, you know, Satine isn't just this pacifist. She, she is a Mandalorian. And so um, having her armor in this to, to convey that she is a Mandalorian, but she's just a little bit different, to convey that they can walk both ways and kind of bring both sides of Mandalore together. That was that was the fun of the story, and I really hope you guys enjoyed this because this was this was fun for me for me to make, and I always care about how much you guys enjoyed it. So let me know what you think down below. Otherwise, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.